Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I think it's my first talk at NCAR uh, formally, but not in Boulder. I, I, I graduated from Boulder 20-something uh, years ago. Uh, I'm a, I, I have to say, I'm a little bit intimidating uh, giving this talk because how many of you are observationalists work with real data? <laughs> Yeah, that's, his, that, that's what I thought, and I said, oh man, I'm in trouble. But, but in any case, I, I selected a topic that uh, I think is, is a topic that will be of interest for, for general circulation, for people working on general circulation models. And, and uh, even though I would discuss about techniques and pre some preliminary results, uh, the, my, some of my co-authors, well, uh, you have your is from Norway, it helps with the observations and interpretation. My Miguel Urco developed one of the techniques, or co developed with me. Harry is my, my student. But Victor is one, a theoretician, is expert on, on fluid dynamics. Uh, I, I have to say, this is one of the, of the two works after working <laughs> seven years in, uh, at IIP, where I'm working with a colleague in the theory department that is in the same floor. No? And after seven years, we were able to do some, this bridge, and I'm, I'm very happy about it. Rafael Marino is, uh, he was an anchor guy, but working in, with Anik Phuket. Uh, he, he's uh, doing DNS simulation, so I need to get some, uh, some support from, from people working on uh, theory to, to help interpret the data and to tell me what, what else we can provide. No? That's, at the end of the, the day, that is what I'm good at ask the community what they want, and we try to do the best to, to provide that information. So I, I, my out, the outline is motivation. Uh, what, what are we after, and why the scales that we want to study? And the main focus is, is two, two, two parts. I, I have one part that is based on that, uh, attacking horizontal scales between 300 and 20, 20 kilometers in the horizontal scale. No, that is some is subgrid scales for, for all the general circulation or for most of the general circulation models. So we want to provide data. What is what we observe in terms of, uh, of these scales in the mesosphere, lower thermosphere? I will come to that. And then the second one is based on a, a recent paper on a case study of Kelvin Home instabilities, the scales of one to twenty kilometers. So two different systems complementing each other on the scales of the, in, the, in the mesosphere, lower thermosphere <coughs> region. Well, most of you, well, I can see some familiar faces, know the composition of, of the atmosphere. So this is the typical composition in terms of the, of the neutral temperature, the troposphere, the atmosphere, the, the stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and the ionized part, the DEF uh, the, uh, region, uh, respectively. For, for the MLT, that is the focus of, of today's talk, I'm focusing in between 80 and 100 kilometers. 80, 100 kilometer dynamics. That is what we, 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 we will discuss. And I will try, and uh, maybe I will try to bring your curiosity, but uh, please stop me if I'm getting too much into the details of the techniques. I do want to communicate what we are able to provide and what are our preliminary results. But it's not my intention that you understand everything about how we are doing it. Of course, I'd be happy to answer questions later or to give you public uh, references or to go in the blackboard and, and go in detail. But I, I would try not to, to be lost into the details of the technique. In the LT, well, it's not new. We have been studying this for, for many years. So just an example, in the polar region, we know pretty much a climatology. You know? The climatology, climatology, this is based on, uh, on 11 years, that's from the Falstool, uh, Falstool's uh, DRL paper. Uh, sonal wind, the, the typical reversal of, of the wind uh, around 90 kilometers in the summer, the dominated uh, westward, uh, eastward wind in the, in the winter, that is something that Wacom a few years ago had the reverse, had the westward dominated, but observation said this is... Uh, is what uh, in, in winter. The meridional wind, uh, that is blue, that is blue, is equator war in the, in the summer, 
And this accompanying this residual circulation, there is the cold, uh, the cold, uh, very, very cold summer, that is from MLS. And something new that we have provided a few years ago is the horizontal divergence. So we know a lot from ground-based observations in terms of climatology. But this told us about the large scale, uh, the, the large scale dynamics of, of the region. Can we turn off? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm I'm bothering this. This one. I'm bothering this. I hope it is on. This is from a recent rocket campaign. Well, last year, last uh, April, uh, Azure rocket campaign in Doya. And what you will see is four rockets being launched almost simultaneously. And these four rockets, they will have, uh, they will release some tracers, you know, chemical tracers, with different composition at different altitudes. And I want you to take a look at this part of the region of the MLT, the white tracers, so, to, so you can get an idea of the dynamical structure in terms of the space and time. If I go... So here the four rockets are launched, two, three, four, and in time, this is showing a strong shears. And just 20 kilometers, you can have shears of a few, few, few kilometers in, in distance. And then it comes Aurora, and that's, that was part of the study. But I will repeat it so you can see that if we had enough money, we can study this type of, uh, of processes by launching many, uh, many rockets. So we launch many rockets, we have cameras on the ground, we can see the dynamics. And from the dynamics, then we can do correlation uh, uh, studies, uh, spectrum studies, uh, structure function studies, and, and so on. So that region is very interesting in terms of dynamics. It's the boundary between the space and the neutral, and the neutral atmosphere. You know? And to, to try to, to, ex uh, to connect it to general circulation models is that this is the energy spectra in stable stratified flows. We know that there are Rossby waves of uh, dominated uh, dynamics with the KH to the minus 3 type of spectra. With, that is approximately 300, 400 kilometers. That is the, the boundary. And then it comes another, another, another slope. Another slope with minus 5 thirds. Uh, I will say that could be gravity waves. Some of my colleagues said, yes, gravity waves are present, but could be also a stratified turbulence. And talking to some expert, you say, well, you're reaching into a topic that could be religion. And if it is religion, you have to be careful, because if you're talking to stratified turbulence, you say everything is a stratified turbulence. If you're talking to gravity waves, every, everything is gravity waves. From now on, well, in the next two slides, I will continue with the discussion. But after that, it will be gravity waves. Just gravity waves, or, or just to avoid problems in these organs. Okay, but this is what we try to to, to characterize. General circulation models stop at 300, 200 kilometers. There are, of course, high resolution models, and and the rest of the smaller scales is parameterized. There are no many measurements that can provide this information. Rockets provide information around here, in the meter, centimeter, millimeter scales. Single radars integrate this, but what we are proposing, and we have two systems, that we, we can attack scales from 300 to 20 and from 20 to 1 kilometers. I will discuss about these two systems. I said the stable stratified flows, and I will uh, uh, show in a slide from my colleague Victor, just for those that are not into a stratified turbulence, what do we mean by a stratified turbulence? Is that it's a mesoscale uh, regime, and it's genera generated locally and without a continuous source of energy. That is the, the basic. It looks like, uh, like turbulence, isotropic turbulence, in the sense that it's a stochastic, it's a strongly nonlinear, and strongly dissipative. The numbers that characterize the, the, the stratified turbulence are basically the Reynolds number, turbulence, of course. The front number, that is something that I learned in, in the in recent months, that is a, a, a a non-linear, non-dimensional parameter that gives you an idea of how, how much stratification is there. 
a very small number, 0.01, is strongly stratified, a number close to 1 is weakly stratified. And then the buoyancy Reynolds number, that is a function of the flow number and the Reynolds number, and the Rossby, we are going to assume the Rossby waves or Rossby effects are, are not dominant in the scales of 300, 200 kilometers, uh, 20 kilometers that we, we want to study. As in the case of gravity waves, in the stratified turbulence, we want to see how the energy cascades down. We want to see if there is a power law or, or how is the connection from this large scale to a small scale. To complement, and that is where I'm not an expert, at this, but this is from uh, Rafael Marino. In the stratifi stratified fluids, we are interested in the buoyancy Reynolds numbers. The buoyancy Reynolds numbers, amount of turbulence, will give us a simple, I'm not saying, uh, uh, I want to say a simple way of differentiating when the different flows are dominant. Huh? If the Reynolds, uh, uh, buoyancy Reynolds number is a small, one, two, is a gravity wave dominated. If it is uh, order uh, 200, it will be interplay of waves and turbulence. If it is much less than that, it will be a turbulent motion. In my second part of the talk, I will show an example of a turbulent motion, a cage, a Calvin Hall of instability, showing this type of parameter. The stratified turbulence is a theoretical concept, but in DNS, in direct numerical simulations, you can get it. You can get it all the time. You can generate it. But then you say, how realistic is the DNS? How realistic are the Reynolds numbers, the Freud numbers, and so on? This is courtesy of Rafael Marino, and this is from his PhD student uh, of, uh, of, of these three flows that could be dominated. I said this is just a stratified tournament, but for now, on waves. Okay? So we're going to look at waves. And without trying to interpret if it is a stratified turbulence or not, we're going to see how the different scales are represented in observations. If we were to have, if reality, this is from a DNA simulation from Marino et al., were like this, we know that our observations cannot do every single point. Either we have a small volume or in, a, in a vertical direction, or we have a cut in airflow imaging, for example. We have a, a small layer at 80 kilometers, but not, thick, not altitude information or thickness. Or we have integrated quantities uh, with satellites and so on. So it's not a simple, a simple, a simple problem. What I'm going to show you is that if we make a sparse measurements in a volume in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the atmosphere, we can go after the climato the, the statistical model, the statistical behavior of the, the background of the background dynamics. So I want to quote here uh, something from uh, Hanley Liu's uh, recent Nature paper. And basically, when I, I saw this paper, I said, "Is like saying, Koki, when are you coming to help us? No? When are you coming to give us information about the subgrade scales?" Because what we are doing is trying to play with the model and see how we reproduce some observations. But what is really going on? What is the spectrum in the MLT dynamics, in the polar regions, in the summer? What are the differences with the winter? What is the spring transition? So how are these slopes? So this is a challenge in, uh, in, in general circulation models to have a good forcing of these missing scales. Because ideally, we would, we would like to simulate a kilometer uh, resolution. But we are not there yet. And even if we are there, maybe we are missing some physics. Right? So what are the observations? There is a bunch of techniques, LIDARs, radars, coherent scatter radars, uh, air glow images, uh, rockets. Rockets would be good if we have a lot of money. Each rocket, I don't know. A couple of million dollars per per launch. That's too cheap. More, no. yeah, higher. Okay, so it's not doable. But it is good to have some 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 idea of what is going. On. What I would describe the first part is radar scattering from meteor trails using VHF frequencies. We are going to use meteors, the trails, 
And from each meteor, we are going to get a point where if we get the, birth, the uh, line of sight velocity. We are going to get a projection of the wind in that point. That is what you need to know. And we are going to know where is that projection, and but we don't know what is UVW accompanying that projection. And that is what we are going to try to get, the UVW. Let's keep this. We have done a lot with single radars, and uh, this is a recent paper from, from Mao Shenhe where we have combined radars at different places in the world at, uh, at 54, and we are able to separate the tides. But that is not what we are here, because this is thousands of kilometers of scales. We want to see scales within Germany, within uh, 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 Norway, what is going on with the, with the spectrum of, of dynamics. So our technique, and that is what uh, we have uh, in, uh, developing in, in recent years, is to divide the volume in very small volumes of observations. So every time that we have a meteor, try to get the radial velocity, but not only in that volume from one perspective, but using tomography, having another perspective. And that is the multi-static approach, by like having other fields of view looking in the same, in the same volume. And not only that, we are developing networks, so a small systems. These are systems that are 5 meters by 5 meters receiving antenna or transmitting antenna of 50 by 50 meters, power very low, so it's easy to deploy a network of, of, of these, of these radars. We have done so, uh, that in Germany in November 2018. Typical observations of a system is 10,000 observations in a day. During this campaign, and I, I said I'm not going to go into details, we got 200,000 observations in 24 hours. These 200,000 allow us to have more, more samples of this volume of 300 kilometers, or plus minus 200 by 30 kilometers in That is the, the, the uh, that is in the sketch. Basically, we transmit and we receive in different parts, in different transmit, in different receivers. That is the blue, so we can triangulate and observe this part, of this part of northern Germany. I will skip this. What would be the easiest or the, the first thing that we can do with many observations is that before, with those many observations, we used to get just the the, the blue wind is one wind vector for 400 kilometer radius. So we didn't have a spatial information. We had temporal and altitude information, but not spatial. One simple way to approach the problem is to do a first Taylor expansion and go after the, uh, the gradients. And then we can go the red vectors. Just not the blue, but now we can get red vectors. We can get horizontally resolved winds by doing some smoothing, some first Taylor uh, uh, order, first order Taylor expansion, or we can do a linear least square fit where we have measurements, and because the problem is underdetermined, we have more unknowns than measurements. We can regularize it, let's say, by having by not allowing too much curvature. And that didn't play, right? This should be an animation, but basically we are solving the the winds. In different altitudes, 84 is red, 90 is blue, 96 is uh, green. The problem with doing this is that yes, we'll give you a nice picture of what is the green doing in average, but from measurements to here we are filtering. We are filtering, and when we are filtering, we are filtering part of the scales that we want. No? We, uh, we filter could be 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers. So we have avoided this, this approach, and maybe, maybe this will be too confusing, but, but what we are going now, instead of going into the wind, we want to go into the spectra, or into the correlation function directly. So I'm a, I'm a chi surfer. Instead of asking what is going to be the wind exactly at a given time, I want to know what is the expected wind, mean wind, and variability for, let's say, January 2020 in San Francisco. So I want to know the 
characteristics uh, of, of, of the process. And that, for that, we are going to get into the correlation function as a function of time and the space of the zonal wind square, the meridional wind square, the vertical wind square, and the momentum fluxes, zonal, meridional, zonal, vertical, vertical, uh, meridional, vertical. That is the Reynolds stress tensor. That is what we are after. Everybody would like to have that. Once I have that, I can give to, for example, to Handy what is the spectrum. Because if I have correlation function, I can do the winner kitchen theorem and go to a spectrum. That is what we, we will do. In both time and space. And the space is, in terms of gravity waves, it would be KL and M, you know, the wave numbers in, uh, in the zona, meridian, and vertical direction. How are we doing this? I said that for each meteor we get a projection of U, V, W, that is the projection vectors, in one position. For another meteor we will get another projection, another position. Traditionally, this information of two different meteors has been not used, has been used just one meteor square, the other meteor square, but not the combination. But what is the beauty of combining? If we combine two, by combining two, we are evaluating, in a way, this matrix, these regular stress tensors at different tau and different s. And that tau and s is given by the separation of the meteor. So here would be an example, and every frame would be every 30 minutes. Every arrow is a detection. Different colors is different geometry, different uh, uh, points of view. What we are doing is each of them being combined with itself. So if we have thousand detections, we are going to have thousand by thousand combinations. So we, get, we uh, increase the number of information that we can obtain from, from the observation. Okay. Can I ask a question about what you're showing here? What here, determines, yeah, yeah, in that animation, what determines where you get a detection? The meteor, uh, because uh, the, the, the meteor and the Earth rotation. Because the, you can imagine that the, that the, the, the meteor source is isotropic, people would say, but in reality there are six well-known uh, sources. And that known sources, I can tell you a couple of them. One is apex, no? that is where the Earth is heading to, rotating to the Sun, is where it's heading, it is like the windshield, the, the car effect, where you are, you are running into the mosquitoes. In this case, we are running into the, into, into the, uh, into the meteors. But when I r the Earth rotates and face the Sun, these are not seen anymore, no? because the windshield is going in that direction, but I'm looking in that direction, so I'm seeing now the ones coming from the sun. And when I'm rotating here, I will see very little, because I see the sun, but just with a small prob uh, probability. So the rotation of that is from the Earth rotation, and that varies in terms of latitude and longitude. So, uh, but that is a simple explanation for, for, for this rotation. So every time the black arrow goes around, there's black arrows going around, that's yes. 24 hours. Uh, this is 12 hours. 12. Okay. Yeah, that's it. In the case of this, that is uh, dominated by the San Mateo uh -huh. uh, time. No? If it is the equator, it would be 12 hours, uh, 24 hours, dominated by the diurnal. Can you say that again? You have a first location velocity in this? You have a first location? No. No, not why you hear the earth rotation. No, the what we have is then getting into the into the into the mosquitoes is just to observe them. But once the meteor passes, leave a trail behind. And that trail behind is like the rocket. The rocket goes up and leave a trail, this chemical release. And by following the chemical release we get the wind. Yeah. In the case of meteor, the meteor comes, the meteor is gone. The the the, the the, the rock is gone, yeah. but leave a trail behind, yeah. and we are seeing the trail moving with the wind. So there is no earth rotation effect. I said I'm going to go into the details, but after this is applied, we have thousands of, of, of observations, 
at different space at different time. And I was telling Handy, I'm not going, and what I'm offering is not to tell you what is the gravity wave spectrum at a given hour in a given day. I'm going to give you the gravity wave or the, the dynamical spectrum, ties and gravity wave, in a week or in a month or in a season. I'm going to, I will try to give you the expected value of the, the, the spectrum. Not one single event, no but what is expected in a week or a month. So in, in this case, I will do a week. Correlation function. We all know we have worked with correlation functions in different ways. How many of you have worked with the structure function? Structure function. Structure function is a concept in turbulence. Instead of correlating two, uh, two values of u times u, for example, we look at the difference of two different uh, components. And in this case, is the Second order structure function is a square, but could be to the cube, to the four, to the fifth. But I will work with the second order st uh, structure function. And that comes back from the Kolmogorov, uh, famous Kolmogorov 1941 paper. In our, in, our, in our system, we are assuming a Gaussian process that is quasi stationary, or y sense stationary, and homogeneous. So, as I said, I'm not, I'm not caring about one hour data, I'm caring about what is the characteristics in a week, and in that week I would expect that the, the, the spectrum has this, the same expected value. So I have the same dice. It's the same dice, but every dice is different number, but the statistics is a uniform distributed, uh, uh, uniformly distributed uh, function. So in the structure function, if you solve this problem, you can decompose the structure function into the correlation functions. And if we look carefully, this is the autocorrelation with alpha, the autocorrelation of beta, and the cross-correlation of alpha and beta. A specific example, the structure function of two components, let's say u and b, or u, u, alpha and beta are the components, is the autocorrelation of alpha, alpha, plus the uh, autocorrelation of beta, beta, and minus the two times the cross correlation of alpha beta. This is what we are measuring. This is what we are estimating. And why I'm bringing a structural function here? Because there is a beautiful property of a structural function, particularly for power law type of a spectrum. And that is this relationship. If you have a power law spectra with minus p uh, exponent, the structural function will have a power law also with p minus 1. So if you don't are, are able to reach to the spectrum for whatever reason, it's not complete or it is, uh, uh, it's difficult to calculate, with the structural function, you can get the slope and from this slope, get the power law <coughs> of the spectrum. That is the, uh, the why we, we were using a structural function as well. And before getting into the results, one more technicality. You saw the meteors are everywhere. So we have different samples. Now it's a trick. Uh, now it's a matter of how we define how to combine. How we define the tau and the p. You know? In this case, how we define the tau and the p vector. This is what we, we need to, to, to find. The tau and the s vector, sorry. And when you have tons of thousands of observations, and here I can give you an example of an altitude 90 in the R, uh, R dimension, the, the radius, and this is uh, hundreds of kilometers, this is a few, uh, few hours, we have thousands of observations to do the inversion. So we can get a cross correlation function with this S and with this tau from 1,000 observations. So we have a very good estimate of that of those correlation. We can do circular, forgetting about zonal and meridional, or we can do, if we are after gravity waves, we can do a long meridional, a long zonal, a long vertical. So depending on where are, where are the processes that we, we are understanding. In these preliminary results that we are doing, since we want to be agnostic, we didn't take Sonal or meridional, we just took distances. So what are we doing here? 
the autocorrelation function of the u square or, or the zonal velocity square and the meridional velocity square zonal is is orange yes no zonal is blue and uh, meridional is orange for different scales so now we are able to give you correlation functions between 20 kilometers 40 60 80 up to 400 kilometers and what is the direct uh, thing that we are seeing this decay with the e folding of 170 kilometers if we get the special function from this correlation and the formula before we get that there is in a log log scale there is a slope and uh, that is around minus, uh, minus uh, around two thirds two thirds would be equivalent to minus five thirds no? five minus p minus minus one is the p plus p one minus p no what was p plus p p plus one p minus one which is, yeah, which is two thirds. Yes, p minus it uh, was. Yes, it's a Kolmogorov had it in the structure function, the p, and then it was the the the, the, the reverse in the in the structure. But here we have defined that p is minus five thirds, so here would be two thirds. Yes, I'm not claiming that it's two thirds. I, I'm putting the, the green as a reference, but it's close to it. That's it from measurement. One day of measurement. This is from seven days, as is my student is presenting a poster. Now for different altitudes. Different colors are different altitudes. 84, 84, 84, 84 86, 88, 1 to 96. So we are getting now the weight number, because this, when I say horizontal structure function, that is equivalent to the weight number in the horizontal, uh, in the horizontal scale. I'm not putting an K or L because I'm not giving the uh, direction. I'm just saying what is the weight number in, in, a, in, a, in the horizontal in the horizontal scale. So we are we are reaching we are getting to that point. We are getting to a point that we can provide a power law from observations. That is for distance. For temporal and this is frequency, the the results are even smoother and. The, I would say uh, more beautiful. What I'm showing here, the kinetic energy, the U square as a function of, uh, of density, of U square, meridional square, and W square. And we are getting a slopes of this at different altitudes after seven days. So seven days of data put together, and that is what we are doing. We see the tides, that is here, this peak. This green is eight hour. This uh, uh, red is 30 minutes. So from 30 minutes to 8 hours, we are providing how is the the, uh, the energy in, in the sono and the meridional, and the, also the vertical. What are we doing here in, in terms of space? We are taking everything that is less than 100 kilometer separation. We can go everything that is 20, everything that is or whatever, but we are taking everything that is less than 100 kilometers of separation. So if there is some gravity waves with 20, with 20 kilometer wavelength, for example, it will be filtered out because it's integrated with the rest of 100 kilometers of separation. I assume that those curves are offset. Are uh, offset? Just yes, to show. If they were not offset, would they lie on top of each other, or would there still be some spread? Uh, there would be a, a small spread in the so tidal. Would grow with height. Yes, in the tidal, for example, is that we know it will increase, increase, increase depending on altitude. In the gravity wave, I have not checked correctly, but in principle, if it is not breaking, it should increase, increase because density decreases. But that's a second question. Are you going to interpret for us why the spectra in horizontal has a different slope than vertical? Uh, I will, I will, I, I will uh, go to Handy because in gravity waves is well known. Although the, what we are showing is different than what is expected, right? Because in vertical is expected minus three, and the horizontal is minus five thirds. You mean the vertical wind or vertical direction? The vertical direction, vertical wind. The vertical wind, uh, I mean, the, the, the lower atmosphere is a flat spectrum. Oh, so that looks good. So it looks good. 
that's right. But this is a, a frequency spectrum. I don't know what's the what to expect from a frequency spectrum. I know the hey, in the in the, in the horizontal. Uh, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. From the frequency spectrum, it's expected minus. Well, it's, uh, this is plus because I'm following the nomenclature from uh, from Halley, the down the down slope. So it's the negative of the of the number that, that we have today. It's one, and if, if you look at Handy's paper, it goes from uh, minus five thirds to two thirds, oscillates depending on the latitude and the season, right? That is what I remember. As I said, I'm not going to go into the interpretation. It would be dangerous because it's only one week. Uh, I would say we would need more data to, to, to tell winter, summer, uh, latitude, equ equator, uh, mid latitude to high latitude, but this is just one seven days of a special campaign that we run, and, and even though I'm not able to respond, but uh, if you say it's flat, we, we can talk up later and see what what we should expect uh, from theoretical gravity waves only, right? right? Yeah, gravity waves. But that is what we are getting. That is the quality, and I put an interpretation that that in the in the that maybe we are not getting to the two thirds or it's lower. Because in this particular period, winter, if I filter, so if I remove the ties from the, uh, from the observations, what I see is long wavelength in vertical oscillations that are intermittent. Few hours here, few hours there, few hours there, few hours there, not occurring all the time. That is not the linear or the primary gravity waves that if even the long Vertical wavelength that should be uh, secondary gravity waves. If uh, Sharon Ballas or Eric Becker would be here, and I ask them what it would be something that with long long wavelength in the vertical direction. But that is a speculation, and I I I, I, would, I want to be careful with that. Cool. What are the two panels on the right side? What is the top and what is the bottom? The top is the tidal fitting of what? So of the of the, of the winds altitude. Sorry, altitude eighty to hundred kilometers. Versus time. But and these are seven days. But what is color coded here? What color coded is the velocity, plus minus 50 meters. Or vertical second. or vertical? This is a sonar in this particular case. Okay. Sonar velocity plus minus 50 meters per second. But what is the bottom? The bottom is the real measure, the original measurement minus the, the tidal component. Okay. With, the, with the idea to, to work with the residual that will be the, the, low, the high frequency component. And here is still the magnitude plus minus 50, the color code. But the magnitude scale, the doctor bridge to that high. Those of you coming to AGU, my students have a poster there, and we'll be focusing more on these results. These are preliminary results, but we, we, we know, we are very excited about it. And we are so excited that we started in Norway just by combining radars that exist. We didn't do much that just call uh, people and say, can we share data and put it in this multi-static-like approach? In Germany, we do have invest, invested money, and then we have a multi-link system there uh, already operating. And in the last two months, we have uh, installed a system in Hikamarca, in, under the magnetic equator, and a couple of systems in southern uh, Argentina. So I hope in a year time, we will have good coverage and, and, uh, and, and results from different latitudes and from different systems. Different conditions. This under the magnetic equator, this uh, in, the, in the hot spot of the of gravity wave in the stratosphere, this is uh, in the southern part of Ar Argentina, this is close to Rio Grande in the border with uh, Antarctica. And of course Germany and, and Norway. How much time do I have? So that is our efforts to cover the 320 kilometer type of structures. In uh, recent years, we have improved our MST radar. I'm switching topics to uh, something smaller, to, to uh, something one kilometer, two kilometer type of uh, structures. And the, why, why we are presenting that now? Because we have improved the resolution by a factor of eight. 
So before we used to have measurements with 5 kilometer or 6 kilometer resolution, now it's down to 1 kilometer. And when it's down to 1 kilometer, the beauty is that by doing down to 1 kilometer and doing imaging inside the illumination uh, volume, we can resolve the structures now in four dimensions. You know? Altitude, X, sono, altitude, meridio, no? and the evolution in time. And I, I show a couple of movies on the, on the animation. We can do it in the traditional radar way, separate S and R, and separate Doppler velocity, and, and you will see later the structure. Or we do it at the ISO, and we combine S and R and Doppler together. So in a way to, to simulate nature, when we have aurora, we see aurora red, blue, or, or green. We see the velocity of aurora. But we see the intensity, our eye, if it is, uh, if it is strong, we'll see it more, uh, with more brightness than, than, than less. But that is basically combining SNR and Doppler in one, in one figure. This is what we are trying to do here. We have Doppler information and we have SNR. But we combine it in one, what we call range time Doppler intensity plot. I will come back to this example. If I make a cut now in this example at different altitudes, this will be the lower altitude, middle altitude, middle altitude, and higher altitude. And I'm putting two cuts, east, west, north, south, as a function of altitude. What I want you to follow, oh, red is coming to us, blue is going away. Green is staying almost zero. I want you to look at the evolution of this. The, green, the arrows are, just for a reference, is the background we obtained from a, another system, from a meteor radar. What I want you to observe is that it started the period, very turbulent, uh, volume feeling, Andreas uh, Muszynski uh, is familiar with MST radar before, the normal assumption of volume feeling, but later there are organized structures, air glow community we call the ripples, you know, ripples moving across, across the, the, the radar. One, two, three, four, five. Organized ripples that are marching in the east-west direction, elongated in the north-south direction. And I was talking to Astrid and I said, when I first saw it, I said, oh, gravity waves. Gravity waves has periodicity, has elongation, looks like gravity waves. Talking to Dave Fritz, he said, Koki, the wavelengths are too short. It's only eight kilometers. The period is four minutes. And they are moving with the wind. Maybe there are instabilities. So something that breaks and is drifted by the wind. No? And then the cuts here, another thing that I want you to notice, the cuts is that the red in the below, in the, in the ripples, is red is to the west and blue is to the east of the below. And I will come back to that again. I was wondering the... In the previous uh, yeah, in this uh, measurement, if you have, uh, say, a uh, nature radar to measure the background large scale, well, then you, you know you could directly measure the horizontal wind. Right? That's what I'm doing. But I thought this is an MST. Which this is MST, but I have a meteor radar. In, in, in I, think, I, think, I think the so, arrow must come from the, the meteor radar. Yeah, then, then you can tell whether the, uh, it, the, the ripples are drifting with the inflow or it. It, it is uh, moving against, or you know. That's what I'm doing here. That's that's why I'm putting the the arrow here. Uh, so are the are the two uh, have the same speed or the same speed? Uh, one is, but it's it's a difficult because I will come back to that. But I, I will come back to that answer. It's a good question. I want you to look at this arrow. is bigger here at the bottom and it's smaller at the top. That is one thing. But later I reprocess the meteor radar. But before getting into that. In Kelvin Holman's instability is uh, the Richardson number, the ratio of the brown bicella to the gradient of the horizontal wind, is what you need to look for the necessary condition for instability to happen. And that condition is that it has to be less than 1.4, than, one, one, than 0.25. Less than, in this case, is, if it is bigger, it's a stable flow. 
There is no instability. If it is less, there is a, ne it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Many papers in our field deal just with the Richardson number. But they are not looking into other features, just, just the Richardson number. So it's not a conclusive evidence that is a, a KHI instability. I'm going to provide more evidence, not only the Richardson number. So what is this? Well, uh, if you are not familiar with uh, kelvin Holmes instability, it's an instability that requires a shear. A shear uh, it occurs in shear flows. They have these cat eye type of structures and normally are separated by some wavelengths. And an initial part is not so turbulent, then it's more turbulent, and then it's more and more turbulent. And it's evolved. It will create also turbulence al across. So this is, in our uh, nomenclature, this would be x, the dimension of the below, the thickness of the below. The transverse to the below is ly, and the separation between billows is lambda x. Previous observation with single radars, this is from Kikamarka. We assume that we have a KHI because we see ripples, and we assume that they are moving across. But we don't have any idea of the actual uh, wave. And we don't have any idea of the elongation uh, there. Coming back to this, uh, this example, the thickness that is set here is 2.4 kilometers. We can see the separation is close to 8 kilometers. And we can see this ridge. I said we need Richardson number. So for Richardson number, I use the meteor radar, and we calculated the velocities. And after getting the magnitude of the of the, of the horizontal velocity, we get a, a vertical gradient, and that is between 35 to 40 meters per second per kilometer. It's a very high uh, shear in, in this in, the, in this field. So we have the shear. If you use a Bram Weissala period of 400 seconds you get a Richardson number of 0.15. So we are satisfying the Richardson number using a climatological brown bicella period of 400 seconds. First condition, we, are, we, we, have, we have a shear. The observations are here Doppler and, 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 and brightness. But to help the reader, I run a, a, a smoothing uh, a locally enhanced, a, a, local, a local enhancement filter. So basically, I run a, a smooth filter and then subtract it from the from the observations and look at the ratio of the residual over the mean. And this is what we get. I'm not faking it. This you can see the cat eye. Red is going up. Blue is coming down. Red is going up. Blue is coming down. It is elongated in 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 y. Red, blue, red, blue. And the wind, I'm again putting the wind here at the bottom and at the top. So my interpretation of this is that this is a diagram. What we are seeing is a shear, stronger at the bottom, weaker at the top. So there is a below in this direction, from down to up. So up in this phase, down in this phase. Up in this phase, down in this phase. And that below is moving with the wind. Coming back to the question. The wind is 60 meters per second here, 20 meters per second there. What would be the velocity that it should move? 60 or 20? Something in between. It's 40. When I measure this velocity here of how it's moving, it's 30, 35 meters per second. So it's almost zero phase. Uh, phase and speed. It's almost drifting completely with that. I have some friends in, uh, in air glow community, so I said, okay, I'm going to use kilogram light. No? Mm -hmm. If you have four dimensional, that, then let's do it like the, the air glow imaging community. So I'm look, looking now at east west cuts for a given uh, y as a function of time. And then it will give us easy way to see the structures moving across and to parameterize what we observe. We get the values of 2.4, 3, lambda of 8 kilometers, delta t of 4 to 5 minutes, 
the Brown body setup period, I'm assuming climatological, of 400 seconds. So, before I said I get a Richardson number of 15, if I compare these parameters, basically the ratio of the thickness to the lambda, to the separation of the billows, this is 0.25. If I compare that to DNS simulations with high Reynolds number, this is from the work of Thorpe, 1973, or you can find it in Fritz and Rastogi, 1985. We are here. We get the Richardson number around 0.1. Another independent measurement of, or independent deduction that the Richardson number condition is satisfied. So we have two already. And then it comes the stratified turbulence. This is where my colleagues come, Victor Abarsko, Absar Kisov. Dimensional analysis. Now I'm going to use dimensional analysis. If I have a scales, let's see what I can get. From the continuity equation, I have LZ, LX, and the RMS velocity and Z. For RMS velocity in the vertical, I'm assuming 12 meters per second. I'm measuring 12 up and 12 down, but I'm just using a conservative value of the half, the half of the minimum, minimum, the maximum minus the minimum of 12 meters per second. That is what I'm assuming. By doing that, I get the RMS sonar velocity of 50 meters per second. Not the mean, but what would be in the below the turbulent velocity in the, in the, inside the below in the sonar direction. Then from the definition of integral length, I, can, I have LX, I have UX, I can get epsilon. I can get epsilon. And this epsilon is close to a 1 per kilogram for the, for the parameters that we have. From vertical scale, this is from one seminal paper on, on stratified turbulence, Vilan and Chomas. I can relate LZ to UX to a local brown visor period. Oh, in this case, frequency, brown visor frequency. When I do that, I get a very small value that is equivalent to a brown visor period of 1,000 seconds. So 2.5 times bigger, larger than the climatological value. That in a way is not uh, un uh, unthinkable because the, we know that the brown bicell period uh, changes. Uh, we, we know from, from LIDAR uh, temperature profiles. But if I use this N in the previous formula, in the, in the Richardson number definition and my vertical uh, gradient of the horizontal wind, the Richardson number now is very, very small. So three independent measurements of Richardson number that are less than 0.25. Finally, the non-dimensional numbers, the theory of uh, the stratified turbulence, remember I mentioned Freud number that tells us about stratification, and Reynolds buoyancy number that tells us about turbulence. If you see, these are based on parameters that we are deriving here. Ux, Lx that we had it, N that we just derived it, and the only parameter that I'm assuming here is viscosity. I'm using 1.15, that is typical in the MLT used at leasing models. When I do that, I get a front number of 0.8, that means it's weakly stratified. So, allowing the KHI to happen, because if it is strongly stratified, there would not be instability. And there is turbulence associated to that. The Reynolds number is high, 2.5, 10 to the 4. So, Richardson number is satisfied, is occurring in weakly stratified. Uh, uh, domain and it's turbulent. We conclude that it's a KHI. Looks like KHI, has the parameter KHI, and has produces KHI uh, background conditions that are that should go with 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 Calvin Calvin. And with that, I want to summarize. I have presented two different approaches to attack mesoscale. Mesoscale, horizontal mesoscale uh, structures. One in a, I would say, a statistical sense of seven days a week or a, a week or a month, and one in a deterministic sense in a event like like uh, cases. And with that, thank you very much. Um, you know, not not being an atmospheric scientist. Uh, I have a lot of questions about what the interpretation of what's going on here. Um, so the the shear, for example, um, 
I could imagine a continuously sheared motion over a great range of vertical scales, and yet this seems to be happening in a relatively thin layer. What, why is that layer? What's determining the location of that layer and why the shear is, you know, what it is to give this instability at that altitude? Yes. You, you are right. Uh, the tight spiral kilometer scales provide already a shear and got a continue. So that, let's say, that is our background. Mm -hmm. And the localization, I would expect that it is gravity wave like uh, point. So gravity waves that if you have a monochromatic gravity wave, there is nothing. But if you have a combination of waves interacting there, they could act or to, uh, interfere constructively to produce a local uh, a stronger shear. I didn't show here. No, I I, I didn't show it, but it's in my paper. I put a. Co a a contour plot. This shear is happening in a in a region of low tidal, where the tide is low to zero, close to zero velocity. So the background was low. So normally you have hundred meters per second plus minus. That's the background, but the shear is happening in the region of plus minus ten meters per second. So it was easier to to to, to create a perturbation. It's not the same to have a shear in 100 meter per second and you say, okay, add, let's add the 40 meter per second shear. It's just already a uh, very dynamical effect. But this particular event was in the, uh, in the region of low, low velocity. So is the velocity, but the velocity is reversing uh, across that region or not? Uh, no. no. No, it's not reversing. In this case, it's not reversing. But something that uh, is in the plot here, and I don't want to discuss it, uh, my motivation with this is I hope that a DNS-like guy would like to take the parameters and provide him flow number, flow, flow number, I provide him the Reynolds number, and simulate this, this event. Because there is a shear in magnitude, but it's also shear in, in angle. So it's shearing. It's not just shearing in, 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 in one direction, it's shearing in both, in magnitude and direction. It's hard to say, I, I wanted to, to have, I would like to have better resolution to see if later in time it's also shearing, the, the, the billow is like rotating at the top. No? So you create a billow, but because in the top it's going in another direction, I would expect some of the rotation. But somehow it's so turbulent that the the bottom turbulent is telling the top, don't listen to the wind at the top. I'm the one telling you what to do. That is where, uh, where, where I, I'm observing. Do you have any momentum flux associated with this? Uh, I, I haven't calculated, but uh, I guess uh, it would be easy to calculate. But it's not, I, well, it would be. Uh, uh, U, U times W calculation, but I don't know if we call it momentum flux. There's no gravity wave involved here. It will be a U times W. Okay, so we will see the momentum flux, but I don't want it to extend it to gravity wave momentum flux because we are not seeing a gravity wave here. Maybe the gravity wave is seeded, but what we are seeing is the breaking uh, of the, it's an instability already. Uh, so on the previous slide, I guess here, yeah, you get some on that yeah, in that figure, you get kind of two uh, fringes or billows, and then you got one that looks like it's merging in there. So yeah. that, it kinda looks like it could be a billow interaction uh, to me. Is yes. that what you think it is? Or? Yeah. Yes, but I I would like to I can imagine many things, interpret many things. I prefer to focus on on the big uh, features. But you are right. I, I look into this and I said, what is going on? But that is almost at the end uh, 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 of the video. So yeah. the energy is not there. It's localized. It's not like occurring in the large scale. But something that is important to notice is that there is a structure here. I don't have the resolution to resolve it. But based on this, there are also billows along Y, and if I follow Dave Fritz's uh, numerical simulations, I would say these are secondary billows. So billows occurring 
in, in the wall of, 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 the, of the main, of the primary of the soil. Okay, so uh, earlier you showed the, the uh, structure function for uh, UU. Would you say that, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, signal to noise, is the vertical wind comparable to the, to the other two, or is it bigger? I, I would say the vertical wind is a different beast, okay. because the magnitudes are much smaller, so some of the imprecisions of the U and W could be leaking into, into the vertical. For one, I'm happy of the vertical because there is no significant slope. So mm -hmm. I will go with you and say the slope is close to zero. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's flat. Mm -hmm. But in this flat, there is some room of noisy, the noise here that uh, we have. I would expect with more data, we will have a better handle of it. Oh, what is going on there? Uh, Kobe, when you calculated or estimated the Richardson number, yes. you just assumed that the Brandt-Weisler period you can take from the climatological data. That was my first one. I calculated three Richardson numbers, but that's the first one. Well, that was from climatological data. Yes. Okay. Uh, what so for, for the first one, you're, you're right, I use uh, 400 seconds. I would think the, there's a bias in there, right? I mean, if you have Kevin Hammond's uh, instability, then usually either you have larger shear than the climatological uh, average or you have uh, less stratification. Yes. So if you take the climatological average for run weisler period as as Based of your estimate of the Richardson number, you may end up with a biased Richardson number. I agree completely. Um, I agree. I agree completely. That is why we went to an independent measurement of that. that was this uh, ratio that I plot. Here we are not assuming. We are not assuming any brown bicella frequency. We are just looking at the characteristics of the billow, and that is the thickness to the wavelength. When you look into that, and from many uh, direct numerical simulations, uh, we play with different uh, Richardson numbers. You get, they got, I didn't do it, Torf et al. 1973 got this function. So basically, say, when it's more isotropic, so the thickness to the wavelength is close to the same uh, separation, the Richardson number is very, very slow. When they the, the S is very small, the Richardson number is bigger. That is one, the second estimation. And the third one was trying to get an epsilon, a, 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 not an epsilon, a Richardson, a brown bison of frequency locally from this dimensional analysis. Yeah, I think I'm more, I'm more skeptical of, about that approach because to use dimensional, dimensional analysis to uh, nail down ratios or dimensional coefficients, uh, which, I mean, each of these quantities, uh, you have to basically add another dimensionless constant before it. Right? And, you know, you can come up with any ratios of them. It's, it's, yes, uh, it's only on the order of one, it, but it could be. That, that is what we want, because even if I put yeah. here, even if I put the climatological value, the Freud number is still 0.1. It's still weakly stratified. A little bit medium stratified, not, not as strong. Or, but, but, but you are right. And we are trying to get out of the most out of, out of the observations. And what we are doing is a four-dimensional characterization of the event. If you look at previous works, they do either one dimension, like radar, set, and uh, x, uh, time, or ergo, that's x and y, maybe time, yeah, time and, but not uh, altitude. The thickness is assumed because the air glow layer, we, we get an average value, but it's normally wider than the, the KHI. Uh, I mean, what I'm saying is uh, dimensional analysis gives you scaling laws, but doesn't say anything about the coefficient, the non-dimensional coefficient. 
in front of this game. For example, the second uh, the second equation there. Yes. You know, there can be a, a three or one third or ten to the yes. minus one. Yes, and that, uh, for that we are assuming the, uh, the constant to be one. I mean, yeah, I, in the paper we wrote it, assuming to be one. You, you cannot it. assume that. That's well, we are uh, we are following some uh, DNS work on, on, on with the similar Richardson number. So, yes, you, you are right. You, uh, ideally, I would like to have this example with a temperature profile that goes along. Right? If we have a lidar or a rocket temperature profile, then we will have an N locally in the below. That would be the ideal case. I mean, just if you if you multiply that u by a factor of two, then you get a factor of eight uh, different in your L. Yes, but uh, the constant is not constant to the cube. The constant is constant u square u cube epsilon. Yeah, but the definition of u, whether you the definition of u depends amplitude or weight, you know, it's what is the U in this case? Uh, dimensional analysis doesn't require a clear definition of U. It could be an RMS value, it could be an amplitude of a wave or something. Um, so it's easy to carry dimensional analysis to overinterpret that. I mean, you cannot say much about the coefficients, but what I'm saying. I think I, I have to agree completely. Most of the stratified turbulence uh, papers are working on in this, uh, this dimensional this analysis. So all the DNS uh, interpretation are in dimensional analysis. But, uh, but you are right. Please. I'm not trying to define exactly the number, but I do want to give a constraint uh, for yeah. Dave Fritz or, or Rafael Marino and say, look, these are the characteristics that we observe. This is the background. And we think we get a number that the Freud number is close to this value, 0.8, and the Richardson number, uh, Reynolds number is high. Can you reproduce our observations? Can you see the evolution? Can these are the secondary ways uh, reproduced? Or, or you will require to increase some parameter that is that we are not measuring. That is the goal. So it's not just to say we observe. At the beginning, I just wanted to show the four-dimensional and do anything about the. Is 35 turbulence. But if I do that to uh, Dave Fritz, he will say, okay, I can get it, but I have 10 knots to play with. No? And he said, well, reduce those knots. Try to work with these two. Thank you. Thank you.